This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got an interview with Ray Dorward. So you might not be familiar with that name. Most of you probably aren't going to be familiar with that name, but he is an incredibly interesting man that I met just really a couple of months ago. But he owns a uh, custom boot making shop. So think Western Cowboy Boots on 2nd and Harrison in downtown Guthrie, Oklahoma. And this guy designs and handcrafts custom cowboy boots, right? So these are not the boots that you're just going to walk into the store, pull off the shelf, spend a few hundred bucks and get on out the door. This guy literally will craft a boot around each one of your individual feet. And a really cool thing is, is we actually do this interview in his shop. So there's going to be some ambient noise. I'm just going to tell you right away. We've got, you know, a train in the background at one point. I think you can hear cars driving by. His apprentice is in there working on boots and they were like, hey, do, you know, do, does he need to be quiet? And I'm like, no, no. Like we want to hear that. You can hear him walking around his boots there on the hardwood floor, the doors opening and closing, but it, it's got a really, really cool sound to it. So it's not going to be, you know, the most studio quality thing that you've ever heard, but I just really wanted to do this in uh, this interview in the ambiance and surroundings of his actual actual shop there in Guthrie, Oklahoma. It's an incredible uh, story of how he even got there, though, because this guy spent almost 20 years as a working cowboy in Wyoming, Montana, the Dakotas, uh, Nebraska. I mean, this guy was the real deal. So if any of you guys are out there and you like the show Yellowstone, this is a real life guy. This is a real life guy that did stuff like that, but he eventually made the transition into making some of the world's best handcrafted boots. But the thing about this interview is... It was it was an interesting interview for me because I always like to prepare ahead of time. I try to I want to make sure that my guests look as good as possible. I want to ask them good questions to just to kind of tee them up as easily as I can so that they can have a good interview. Guys, I didn't even get to a quarter of the questions that I wanted to ask Ray Dorwart, and we talked for well over an hour. But the thing about it was, is because th- this guy can really, really get into a story. And the thing is, is if you try to cut a story off, because I've watched interviews with him before and guys are kind of cutting him off because they, they think he's done talking. I wanted to make sure to give him room to breathe. I wanted to make sure to give him room to tell his stories because as I'm listening to him tell his stories on this interview, but even before the interview, after the interview, it's almost like, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. So when you talk to somebody who um, they, they have regret in their life about conversations they didn't have, maybe they didn't spend a lot of time talking to grandpa, uh, you know, about his time in the war. Maybe they didn't talk a lot uh, about grandma, what it, what it was like during the Great Depression. And then once those people are gone, you just lose a lot of those stories or they become extended to the point where you're not sure what's real and what's fake. That's the sense that I got when I was listening to Ray and his stories is he is a sage. He is a guy that has lived a a, a rough life. You know, he chose a lot of that rough life being a cowboy. Um, but this guy has a tremendous relationship, uh, with, with his family, with his wife. He's got an unbelievable discipleship with Jesus Christ. And we get into that at several points and guys, there's several points in this conversation where Ray stops talking and it's not because he's thinking it's because he's choked up. He even gets choked up right from the beginning of the interview. But guys, there are some incredible stories in here. And so there's certain parts in there where if you're not really into custom boot making, maybe you're not that interested in it, but it is kind of cool to hear how a master craftsman is able to put something like that together to, to get out to the public. And there might be some sections about cowboying that you're not really that big on. But guys, there are so many different notes that you could get from an interview like this, from a guy like this. And guys, toward the end of the podcast, we talk a lot about, I kind of introduce how I even got introduced to him and, and how we even uh, got into uh, a friendship with one another. And it's a really interesting th- story there toward the end. But also I talked to a real life tough guy about what it's like to be a Christian and a tough guy. So at this point, if you're not interested in listening to this episode, I don't know what I can do for you. I'm doing all that I can because this is such a good episode, guys. It didn't go in any way that I thought thought it was going to go, but in a lot of ways, I think it was way better. So guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Ray Dorwart, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, I'm, I'm so excited to be here with you. And in, in the introduction, obviously, I, I talked about the fact that we are in your shop, like we are literally in your shop right now in, you know, historic downtown Guthrie, Oklahoma. And so being able to talk to you about the things we're going to talk about today, also being in your shop is kind of a cool deal, but, but a great way to, to start this. And I don't normally start interviews this way, but I, I have a feeling that we'll get some good content there is I want to get a little bit of information about, tell us about your childhood, because we're going to get into the, the stuff you did as a cowboy. We're going to get into boot making. We're going to get into all those things that are why people are tuning in to listen to this episode, but give us a little bit about, you know, where'd you grow up? What was it like? Uh, what was your family like? growing up 
My family, I probably am uh, pretty biased on that. It's uh, it was a good family, uh, uh, just tremendous. I had a I had a dad. I had a dad that was uh, everything that I wanted to be, and uh, he was. Uh, he took us boys everywhere with him, did all kinds of stuff, and and uh, <laughs> one one of his statements was, uh, "Little pictures are be seen and not heard," and because we were that way, then he he took us, he, and we got to experience a lot of things, kids, young kids, uh, little kids, and uh, never got to experience because he he just took us with him. We did a lot of stuff. He did a lot of different things. Uh, <clears throat> I grew up, or was born in Nebraska. We moved to uh, Colorado. We moved to Hawthorne, California. Uh, moved back to Nebraska. Moved to Inglewood, California. Moved to Citrus Heights, California. Moved back to Nebraska. And actually, I went to uh, and we moved around the state of Nebraska and whatnot, but I went to 11 different schools from the time I started school in kindergarten until I graduated high school. The last two years, uh, my junior, senior year, we were in the, I was in the same school. And uh, so that made it kind of tough. I don't know how it is for girls, but I know boys growing up, it's, it's a tough deal because you get to a new area, new school, new whatever uh, community, you've got to fight your way to a point where you're wherever you level out in that pecking order. And, and it seemed like uh, I grew up fighting and get to the point where, where you're uh, accepted by those below you and those above you if you've got somebody above you. And, and at that point in time, you got friends in and, and then in six months you're moving and doing it all over again. And I used to really, I know, uh, I've got a brother that's two years younger than me and another one that's uh, nine years younger. But uh, Bart, my one runner right underneath me, he and I really struggled with that for years because uh, we just didn't think it was fair to have to move around and go through all that stuff. But as I grew older and, and uh, left home and and things that I did, and I I found that that was quite a quite a benefit because we got to experience uh, many cultures uh, and interact and and got to see a lot of different country and and so it made me a rounded more rounded out individual my adult years to where I could meet and visit with somebody and. <laughs> just anybody and and had something in common somewhere you know uh, somewhere we'd been or seen or somebody we knew or you know it's just a uh, opportunity to visit which in the end turned out to be a a good deal for uh my business that i'm in now because i've got people from all over the world besides just the united states come in and and get to visit with them and spend some time with them one of the things that our dad impressed upon us uh, that was so important was uh, when somebody takes time to visit with you, you need to visit with them. Uh, look them in the eye, talk to them, and, and listen to them. Uh, and so that's, that's helped me a great deal in my, in my business, being able to do that. My dad did a lot of things uh, throughout his life. He always... Um, his desire was to continually uh, do better to provide for his family better. So every time he took a new job, we moved, it was to better the family, and, and it did. He was uh, one interesting thing. Yeah, well, man, there's a lot of interesting things. I could spend a lot of hours on my just sure. <laughs> growing yeah, up. Yeah. But uh, when we was in Colorado, uh, he worked for an uncle there, and he was a— uh, my uncle had, was actually a medical doctor, but he had a mining company, and my dad worked for him as a, 
as a prospector and a claims, uh, uh, um, I lost a word I wanted to use for that, but uh, he filed claims for him. And I was in the period of uh, uranium was big in this country and, and it was uranium mines is what they were doing. But I remember when I was somewhere in my, I don't know, mid fifties, dad made mention that, that and that would have been 20 some years ago but 20 years ago but uh and i don't remember what we were talking about at the time but he says you know he says there's probably still stakes on uh vale mountain that's got my name on it yeah and of course it's uh uh a ski resort now but anyway it was a neat deal neat experience he he saw a lot of things that uh uh, a lot of people probably like to have seen. Uh, he worked uh, all of uh, western Colorado, portions of uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. And, and I remember he'd be gone for, he might be gone for a week or might be gone for a month, and he'd come home and he'd have some dinosaur bone he picked up and or he'd talk about Pueblos that he found and, and crawled around in them. And he said there, I remember him talking about pottery and different things in them pueblos you know and he never took anything but he just kept that uh story to give to us kids but that was pretty neat so anyway that's some of my childhood i whew, wow i mean well there's so many ways you could go with that but one of the things that i think is really interesting even here you talk about your dad you obviously have a tremendous amount of reverence for your father and who he was and the cool thing is is you know one thing that i've seen i've i've physically seen in the interactions that i've had with you i mean you, you do you look me dead in the eye and, and i grew up you know basically in this this distracted culture where if you get that buzz in your pocket you got to check it immediately or or you're in one of those social settings and you're talking to somebody and you can tell they're kind of looking over your shoulder to see if there's someone more interesting that yeah. they need to be talking to so it's that it's that wisdom that it doesn't have to be complicated it's just simple but the thing about you and about your early childhood which has kind of developed you into who you are today certainly is you spent a lot of time as a real working cowboy, and you spent time in Montana and Wyoming and in the Dakotas. So, kind of take us through, you know, why did you, why were you kind of pulled to that type of work? Because that's not a lot of work that most people are wanting to sign up for. That that's tough, hard work. And kind of give us an idea of what you did and what that experience was like. Well, it it, it went way back to to my childhood. My dad always had. When I was younger, he's all, he always had some horses around. So I, I, I learned to ride when I was very young. Um, and, then there was, and then there was a period of time when he didn't have any horses anymore, and, and we uh, had neighbors that had horses we rode. We did, uh, we had some neighbors that, uh, there was a, <clears throat> we was going to country school at the time, and, and uh, there were some neighbors lived a couple, Two and a half miles to the northeast of us there, and and there was a one boy that was a little older than I was, a year older than I was, and and then and his brother was the same year as my one brother, and uh, man, we just we spent all the time we could a, a horseback, and they were and they were actually farmers, but they had horses, and we just had a a blast there, and that and that and. When we was little, up till probably my, uh, probably up to the time that I was in eighth grade, uh, actually, <laughs> we had to be in bed at eight o'clock, clear up until I was, I started uh, high school. And after that, I could stay up until nine. It was kind of an interesting deal. I. As I was the oldest, I had an older brother that had died many years before, but as the oldest, uh, everything was uh, gauged off of what age I was. For example, I couldn't get me a BB gun until I was nine years old, but when I was nine years old, I got a BB gun. But my brother that was seven, year old, seven years old, he got one right at the same time. Okay, <laughs> so you kind of lost out a little bit. <laughs> and that's kind of how, how things went, but... Uh, Anyway, we had to be in bed at eight o'clock, and and Dad would come in and and he'd read us stories. And uh, a lot of them were books of of his childhood, and there was stories of by uh, uh, Jack Lord, you know, 
North to Alaska and Kazan and Son of Kazan, and then there was uh, another one called Two Little Savages, and 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 just different books. And then he got into reading Luke Short, and uh, which is a Western paperback author, and and so growing up where I grew up in the different places, uh, that was that was my driving force was was cowboy for some reason and and of course we watched all the uh black and white uh tv serials on westerns during the uh late 60s early 50s uh, uh late 50s early 60s and so the last time we moved back to uh nebraska uh, southwest Nebraska there <clears throat> after leaving California my grandpa uh, on my dad's side that's where he and my grandma lived and my grandpa had had owned a lot of country in that that area and and uh, most and he leased it all out but there was one one outfit that it that leased some of his and and uh, I went to work for him and and it was they raised cattle, but they raised crops too. And uh, the one brother that I actually worked for uh, was a cowman, and that's where I really started learning about cattle. And and uh, and um, it was uh, I learned a lot from that man. He uh, kind of took me in as his son, basically, and and taught me a lot. But anyway. Then I went to graduate from high school and, and uh, went to a junior college and then went to the University of Nebraska and, and got hooked up with the rodeo team. And, and it just, uh, actually, I take that back. I, uh, I left, I got out of high school and, and uh, had a cousin that was going to Montana and he was going to go to work for Glacier National Park. Uh, for their maintenance crew, and he's went come driving into our yard. Actually, I was working for that Don Wallen at the time, and he come pulled into the by the shop, and I happened to be there, and Don was there, and he came in and said he was going to Montana to go to work. Had a job up there, and uh, wanted to know if I wanted to go with him, and and uh, Don Don says, man, if it was me, I'd go, and I says, you sure? I mean, <laughs> I'm working for you. And he says, no, nah, I'd go. So we did. I thought, man, I was 18 years old, and, of course, I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And I sure, of course. I could get a job anywhere doing anything. didn't matter whether I get on at Glacier National Park. So anyway, get up there. We drive up there, and and uh, I I took my vehicle, and, and Steve had his, but he went to – checked in and I went to West Glacier to the to the uh, uh, headquarters for Glacier National Park and asked for an application and and they uh, gave me an application and and I filled it out and they said there's really no jobs available because those are all taken up year in advance and there was a gentleman walked behind the young ladies there at the desk and uh, he looked at me, he said, hello, and I said, hello, how you doing? He says, fine, and he, he walked on down the hall, and he turned around, and he came back, and he, he says, uh, do you know anything about horses? And I says, yeah. He says, do you ever drove a team? And I says, no, but you can teach me. I mean, I can learn. He says, let me go find a job for you. So he'd get, he actually got me a job, which was, uh, it was called a fire control aid, but my actual job was running a pack string out of a of a, a one district of Glacier National Park to the fire lookouts and the trail crew, and that was an amazing, amazing deal. And, and I tell you what, that <clears throat> that is, uh, I I would like to say that is that was all God's deal uh, because uh, he just. For so much of my life, he's opened up so many doors that uh, that were just unexplainable, other than his presence involved in that. 
so I did that for a couple of years and and of course coming out of that big old open plains country where you can see for miles and miles I got to where I was claustrophobic in them mountains because you can't see anywhere uh, unless you get up above tree line and then you can see another row of mountains on the other side right of course <laughs> yeah but uh a lot of neat stories there uh i had opportunity i don't know how how much of this you want to hear but uh i had uh camp i was in was walton station it was ranger station and there was a little uh 1940s uh airstream trailer that i lived in in that camp and had a barn set of pens and mules pack mules and we rode saddle horses and pack mules and it was dark out <clears throat> and uh and i i've lost the name of the of the uh gentleman that was the head of all the glacier park at a and he was out of west glacier he and the next guy down come rolling in and knocked on my door and they said they had a uh, young boy that was stranded uh, that we had a lot of rain and not only the rain but it it uh, took the snowpack and and the middle fork the flathead ran right there by my camp uh, was just you know, above flood stage there was a lot of water in, in that what turned out to be was that morning uh, this boy and his family and grandpa and whatnot was on the one side of the river fishing and he fell in and and got swept across to the other side and they spent all day they got a hold of it was it was a crazy deal to me i don't know why they didn't come to me early in the morning but they got a hold of headquarters and and the and uh, Glacier, West Glacier, and, and those guys came down there and they tried putting a boat in and going across. They tried all kinds of stuff. So they wait till it's dark and then they finally come get me and wanted me to know if I could get them down to where it was at. And it was, uh, I knew the place or where the, roughly where it was and it was it was dark out. And it was overcast, there was no lights and, and uh, and I just a few days before that had been down through there and there was a sow grizzly down there it had five cubs which is unbelievable to have five cubs right I don't know if they all survived but uh, I was just not very comfortable in the dark not being able to see and sure. knowing that they're down there and uh, one thing you never want to do is between be between the, the mom and her cubs that's so bad deal but anyway we uh i gathered up some rope the boy was stranded on a a big huge boulder off the shore there about 10 foot or so and uh and they had told me that and so anyway i had uh, i got some rope and we got some a pack with some hot chocolate I made up some hot chocolate for him because he's been there all day and so I get him there, never ran into grizzlies, I praise the Lord on that. Never did on coming back. But uh, I had to, uh, <laughs> I, had, I tied a rope around myself and I waded down into that water and that water is running hard and it's about not quite between my, between the top of my chest and my waist. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, very swift and the rocks are slick. And, and anyway, I get across there, and uh, he's and I had I had to really talk a long time for him to get him off of that boulder. Uh, he was so scared. Got him down, got him across, got him back home safely. The interesting thing was they had a article on that in the uh, Hungry Horse. There's a little little uh, town uh, west of there, kind of west of there, but. Uh, hungry horse uh, community in it. There was a hungry horse dam there. It was all. It had a billboard said either side you coming into town. It says a uh, 
the smallest damn town in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was spelled D-A-M, though. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the article uh, talked all about them head rangers and how they saved this boy. And, <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, hey, hey, I'm the guy that was worried about the grizzly bears. I'm the guy that was ready to go. Well, I mean, it seems like you, you have so many stories from that time period. But, I mean, how, how much time did you spend as a cowboy in, in that area? before you kind of transitioned off into being a, being a boot banker? Oh, I was, uh, that, that's the beginning of the beginning of the beginning there. Sure. But uh, I left there, and actually I, I uh, worked in southwest Nebraska, Cowboy Dare. I uh, worked for uh, basically one guy, did some day work for another, some others around there. But then I moved to uh, South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which was – Oh, I was 25, I guess, then, which was an interesting place. That that suited me for my time. It, it was, uh, uh, yeah, I got a lot of stories on that, too. But uh, at one point in time, uh, my folks used to, used to get the U.S. World News and, and uh, um, I've lost the name of the other one. Something's very similar to that. I don't remember which magazine it was, but they used to send them up to me in the mail because I liked reading them. U.S. World, U.S. World News, and uh, that doesn't matter. So anyway, I get this one, and I'm reading through this one magazine. I don't remember which one it was, and it said the ten most likely places to be killed in the United States. Number one, of course, it was by uh, uh, population. Sure. Uh, number one was Detroit, Michigan. Number two was Pine Ridge, <laughs> South Dakota. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I kind of give you an idea. Uh, but there, that was it was it was just kind of wild and crazy, and and that suited me fine. Um, left out of there and went to Wyoming. Uh, I spent a little less than. 20 years cowboy, actually cowboy. Uh, I worked on little ranches where I did everything from riding to fixing fence or climbing windmills, which I it's pretty hard for me to do a windmill because I'm not much for getting on heights. And it's when you're up at the top of that tower and uh, you got both hands wrapped around the tower, it's hard to get anything done. Sure, right. <laughs> but and then I then I worked on some bigger outfits where where I just drew riding wages and uh, there was a point in time in my and I and I was not uh, a I was a believer I guess you might say because I believed God was real I believed Jesus came to earth but I had they I had no desire to be in that I mean I, I just was I was in a complete different direction and the reason I believed because I my folks took us to Sunday school and church when we were in, in uh, living with them up until a point when I became a junior and I started doing a lot of other things didn't go to church and whatnot but but I had never accepted Jesus it was nothing to do with my lifestyle and I didn't want it right so I'm in uh, Wyoming. Uh, I've got a camp that I'm in. I got a little over 3,300 head of cattle I'm riding, and it's uh, places 52 sections, so it's a lot of country to ride. And I had uh, had a horse go down. I'm not going to go through all that probably at this time, maybe, but uh, had quite an experience, and actually actually died under that horse on the side of the mountain in Wyoming and had a had an out of body experience that uh, I saw this huge being and uh, and I thought it was Jesus or one of his angels come to get me which wouldn't have been right anyway because 
I'd never <laughs> asked him to be my Lord and Savior. But so anyway, this I see this being up on this ridge, and and uh, he was uh, huge. I can't tell you how tall he was. He was he was huge. And I'm just I'm going up this ridge to to him, and he's standing there, and he's got a a robe on, and he's got his hands tucked in the sleeves of his robe, and he's got a turban on. He's got this huge black beard. So I get up there, and I'm I'm looking at him. I'm on his left hand side, and he's still just staring down the down the mountain there. And uh, I don't know how long this all transpired. You know, a lot of things happened right through there. But anyway, at one point in time, I looked down. I could see my body laying on the ground down there, and, and the horse was getting up. But then the next thing I know, I'm laying. I am laying on the ground, and I'm looking straight up in the sky and I uh, and I know I'm hurt I know I, I don't hurt but I know I am and uh, so I'm wondering what happened to the horse and I kind of get rolled up and I find him and, and he's not just a little ways from me and so I get up and I check him and I know I'm not going to go through the whole deal on that but uh, at any rate uh I had a one of my old riding partners, Kenneth <coughs> Kenneth Metling. Uh, f in fact, today we probably be it's been over close to 45 years we've been friends, and he's kind of friend that uh, you know you don't talk to maybe for a year, and when you do, you're just like you talked yesterday. Although now he calls every day, but <laughs> but anyway, he was working for. Uh, John Scott landing cattle out of Hardin, Montana. For some reason or other, he quit and he come down to see me. And uh, we were laying around there, and he was there for a couple of weeks. And we still, I still did whatever I needed to do, and he rode with me. But uh, I had wound up. I had uh, two broken ribs and a cracked rib on the front side. My sternum was split about. Uh, six inches up and uh, I had just wrapped myself up with torn up some t-shirts so I could breathe but uh, anyway Kenneth says he's telling me we were riding one day and he says uh, you know cowboys are the only only people that I know of that quit their job and go to see a friend to do the same thing they quit <laughs> <laughs> but where I'm going with this story is we evening times we'd lay around that camp there talking about what we were wanting to do and and uh, different than what we were doing. You know, I was 34 years old, 35 years old, something like that. And uh, I owned a pickup and a bedroll and a saddle, and that was about it. And, and what really, later on, what really changed my mind was uh, about what I was going to do was the manager of the, of the ranch, the, the main ranch, would come up every couple of weeks, show up about 5.30 in the morning, and I come to find out what he did was he came up to eat breakfast, because you know, never, he'd never ride out with me or anything and never really talk about the cattle. And so anyway, uh, he and the owner, uh, Mr. Pace out of Texas, uh, showed up one morning and I fixed him breakfast and he wanted to know what what I was going to fix for dinner I said well I don't know I said I was going to ride that uh, what I called the chalk bluff pasture which was a 40 mile ride round trip I said I was just going to take my pack of lunch with me and he says man I wanted Mr. Pace to eat some more of your food and so I said okay I'll find something around close to do and so I'd, I did and I don't, I couldn't tell you what I fixed that day, but they showed back up in the camp there about noon, and and that, I mean they were eating. Now it was almost, I, I think back about it, it was like they were uh, double handed. You know, they were just really, they were really eating. And Mr. Pace says, "Man, this is the best best food that I've ate for a long, long time." And Jack Runner was the manager. He says, "Yeah," he says. Ray's practicing up on his cooking, 
So when he gets so crippled up, and he can't <laughs> ride anymore, he can cook on these ranches. And and he said it in jest, and we all laughed about it. But when they left, I got I was thinking about that, and I was think I thought about that, and thought about that, and I thought, you know, I've worked enough of these ranches that had some old broken up cowboy there that that had a place to stay and a bed to bunk, you know, and and meals and and he always had the guys off list jobs and i thought you know i just don't want to do that so anyway so it kind of brought me back to what kenneth and i was talking about prior to that and and he was he was going to leave the ranch and go to uh california and learn go to work for a rain trout a cow horse trainer and and learn a different something different and and i and i thought well, i'm going to start building saddles well we talked about this for at nights for two weeks, you know, and and he kept saying, "No, you need to build boots." So that's how I got started in the boot making. Uh, I thought, I thought, you know, I need to, I need to find out who this Jesus is. So I thought, I need to buy a Bible. I need to go to church, and I need to start praying. And so it was another. And I was like 89 miles from town. So it was another four months or so before I I finally quit and found a job closer to town and and uh, started doing that. And the interesting thing on that is this went rocked along for for about uh, five years, close to five years, and uh, I had uh, had a friend that lived in town and and he had a some evangelist was coming to their church and and he says uh this guy's going to be here friday saturday and sunday and he says i'd like to have you come listen to him he says he's he's a guy that uh does this at livestock shows and rodeos and you know he he says i think you'd enjoy him i says yeah i'll, I'll try to get there do you know what the word try means, don't you? Yeah, exactly. It basically means you're not going to do it. That's yeah, a polite way of saying I'm not <laughs> yeah, coming. Yeah, there's no way. <laughs> so, so he, but he pursued me and pursued me and pursued me. And finally, he called me uh, Sunday early afternoon. He says, this guy's going to be here tonight. The last time he's going to be here, would you come? And I says, I'll be there. So I drove down and went to it. And, uh, and I can't tell you what he talked about have no idea don't even remember he sang a little played a piano and, and had a message and all that and but when i'd walked in there i walked through the door and it was about three steps to the back pews and i sat down right on the right next to the alleyway or the uh not the alleyway but the aisle so i could get up and i could leave so he was up there in front, and I could tell he was coming to the end. And so when he did, I just stood up, and I turned around and had about a step and a half, and he was standing between me and the door. And I have, to this, I, this day, I have no idea how he got down there that fast <laughs> and how he got there. But he, he just had a smile on his face, and he looked me in the eye, and he says, Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? And I says, No, I haven't. He says, it's really easy. We can do it right now. And I says, no, I think I'll think about it. And he stepped away and I walked out. Well, the reason I bring that up is the fact that for four or five years, I've been reading my Bible, I've been praying, and I've been going to church. To what avail? Sure. How many people spend their whole life in church and never, never have made that commitment? And you've got to. The Bible's pretty specific about it. Speak it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, you know, and, it, and you've got to. So anyway, that was a, after that, I went home that night. And uh, my wife at the time had left and I, and I had moved everything out of the house. And so I'm sitting on the floor there and I have my Bible and I'm thinking about that. And, and, uh, and so I asked Jesus that night, to be my Lord and Savior, that I needed needed Him, and 
anyway, I from that from that horse wreck, uh, my life changed tremendously. Although I thought I was going the right direction, uh, seeking Jesus, I I really hadn't all the knowledge on that. But out of that, also I I decided I was going to be a bootmaker, and uh, and I went to Utah and paid a bootmaker to teach me how which was uh, a two-week course, and I left out of there, and he said I was a master bootmaker. <laughs> hey, after two weeks, that's, that's not bad. <laughs> I've been doing it over 38 years, and I, and I don't consider myself one now at all, because I learn something all the time. But, uh, but anyway, uh, neat deal about it was uh, I had, I went back to my hometown and set a shop up there and, and started building boots. But early on, uh, I met a guy out of Fairfax, Oklahoma. In fact, actually, uh, I had called, I was, had, at that period of time, there was a boot company out of Fairfax, Oklahoma called Blue, Griffith Blucher Boots. And it had a long history of going clear back to Gus Blucher, went, went to, uh, Justin, and there's a really a neat, neat history and story there. But uh, they had a stronghold of bootmakers, or, or cowboys buying boots from them in western uh, Nebraska, western Dakotas, eastern Montana, and eastern Wyoming. And one of their one of their biggest selling boots they sold these guys was a wax French calf. Because it's a good work boot leather and it and it wears and lasts. So I had a guy ordered a pair of wax wrench calf, and so I ordered a ordered a hide out of a place in Tucson, and uh, I got it, and it just didn't look like what I thought it should look like. So I knew Blucher. That was their one of their big selling leathers. So I called, hunted up in the Western Horseman their phone number and called them up and this guy answers and I tell him who I am and what I do and I'm what I'm wanting to talk to somebody about what wax French calf really looks like and so the conversation ended up to be about 45 minutes close to an hour and uh, he says why don't you come down to Oklahoma he says I might be able to show you some things and and uh, I can sell you some last I got some last down here so I says well, who am I talking to? And he says, well, this is Jay Griffith. I says, okay. I says, I'll be down in, a I'll come down tomorrow. So the next morning I came down to Oklahoma and went in and introduced myself and visited with him a little bit. And he took me in the back and, and they had 20 some employees back there. And he just took me around, introduced me to all the employees and, and turned me loose for about 10 days or so. I was there and, and uh, I learned a lot just by watching and and uh, I didn't interrupt anybody but somebody wanted to say something to me so so I went back home and Jay c called and wrote me for almost seven years wanting me to go to work for him and uh, in the meantime he had uh, sold his interest out and he'd moved to Guthrie Oklahoma so I I thought at one point in time, I thought, you know, I need to go down there and, and go to work for him because I could probably learn something. He'd been building boots 50-some years. So I called him up and says, you still interested in me coming down there to go to work for me? He says, yeah. I says, I'll head out tomorrow. So I came down. That's how I got to Oklahoma. I was I was curious because uh, we talked and we met in Oklahoma, but I mean, every part of your story has had a lot to do with everything except Oklahoma. Yeah. So I'm glad you, glad you got to that. So I get to Guthrie, Oklahoma. And it was in April 13th, uh, 1989. And 10 days later, they had the uh, 100 year celebration for the land run, which they still have today yet even. But uh, that was a 100th year celebration of it. And that parade they had for it was four hours and 45 minutes long. It was the largest parade I've ever seen in my life. It was really, it was amazing. Pretty neat. So anyway, I'm down here and I and and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to be here for two years. This is what I'd set in my mind because there's way too many people, 
and there's way too many trees I can't see anywhere. Okay. And I still can't see anywhere. Yeah, true. I'm still in Guthrie, Oklahoma, however many years it's been, but, oh, 30 years. Isn't that something? That's nuts. I'll tell you something interesting. I I had my shop. I worked for Jay uh, for probably about two years, and then I uh, moved in with a saddle maker a uh, block south of here in what was Guthrie's very first livery stable. And uh, and then I still went up and helped Jay. Uh, but uh, I was driving through town one morning. It was early. And I, uh, there was somebody met me with, in a car, and they waved. I waved. A couple people on the street walking along there waved. And I thought, you know, I've been here long enough that people recognize me. And I thought, how long have I been here? And I thought, oh, I've been here five years. Man, that's almost too long. Because that's the longest I'd lived anywhere in my life. Sure. My whole life, five years. And uh, so anyway, I'm still here. People are good. I still got a brother in, in Wyoming. He's got a ranch there. I can go out there anytime I want. And, and all I have to do actually is drive about 10 miles west of Guthrie and it opens up but nothing like the high plains but it's not you can see some <laughs> yeah absolutely well the cool thing about that is it is kind of good to get the story of how people settle where they find home to be because you know i'm from lot and was there for you know 18 years lot in oklahoma moved to edmond so i've kind of settled in edmond that's where my wife and i are, are here now but the the thing that's that's interesting is is how you could be in a place like guthrie oklahoma which most people can't find on a map and to be able to produce the things that you produce and so you may not consider yourself a master boot maker but i think everybody else on the planet especially anyone that's got a pair of your boots would definitely consider consider you that so kind of take us through the, the process of you've got someone that that contacts you somehow or they walk into your shop and they say hey I, I want a pair of boots kind of kind of walk us through what that process looks like that's uh I learned it took me a little while to, to figure this out when I first started building boots because there's a myriad of colors and leathers and and uh, somebody'd want to come in never had a pair of boots before and they want to order a pair of boots and so I'd scatter all this leather out and start talking this and that and and it's uh it's interesting because we've got we've got this I don't know what a built-in mechanism in us that we go into a store and we see something we like that's finished whatever it might be even if it's a garden hose, you know, and uh, and we know what it looks like, and this is what we want. Mm -hmm. And so I would get so many uh, variables out there that they would be confused, and they would say, "Well, I don't, I'm not sure. Let me think about this," and then I'd never see them again. Hmm. So, and that that went on for a few years from early beginnings of my boot making and so then I, I learned to uh, when somebody was interested in a pair of boots and one pair of boots that I'd some of I'd ask them questions like what do you want to do with them you know do you want to sure enough work in them do you want them for casual do you want them for dress what's some colors that you like or what's some colors you don't like and then that gives me a a, a point where I can bring out certain things that fit in their uh, in their in their idea of what they're looking for and and uh, so that makes that process of 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 the design easy or easier and that 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 part of it and and usually that's the second part I go through but uh, that part can take 10 minutes or half hour uh, but the important part is the first part, and that's the measurements, and, and, that, and that's where I take a, a line measurement around each foot and then take a tape measurement with a circumference on eight different uh, points on each foot and leg, and, and then that is what the, what the boots are made from, that, the measurements. We use a, compute the measurements into paper patterns and, and then cut out the leather, and in the process of building boots, uh, 
from that point on is uh, just assembling and whatever needs to be done. But. And so, so for you, because there's a lot of guys out there that, that mm-hmm. own Western boots, you and I kind of met because I was so frustrated with the process mm-hmm. of finding boots that kind of fit my foot. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, you know this, every foot's a little different. Your left and right foot are probably different sizes. They're, they're yes, not sir. the exact same. So what is the difference uh, for you that you can communicate to, to our listeners in terms of if you just go into the store and you go into some Western store and you, and you buy a pair of boots and you pull them on and you just kind of make do versus what you do, which is literally custom making a boot around to someone's foot yes i custom make uh and they're made to measure uh custom made boots could be you could you could pick out the the colors and the leathers you want and they just put them on a st- build a boot on a standard last but a made to measure computes all them measurements you take into that process it fits your foot for first and foremost uh you don't have any uh, loose spots where you shouldn't have them, don't have any uh, extra tight spots where you shouldn't have them. That's what wears out footwear. But you got a you got a piece of footwear that fits your foot and the mechanics of your foot, how it operates when you're walking, uh, that that causes these boots to be uh, long wearing, extremely comfortable. I've I've had people that have, that have worn boots. Um, but not a custom made to measure boot and uh, and they'll say they'll want to they'll want them a dress boot they want to wear on Sundays or to weddings and I says that's fine but I know once you start wearing them you'll you'll want to wear them more than those because it's a it's a fit a feeling that you can't imagine when I was uh, I bought a pair of boots Kenneth my buddy I talked about I was I was, uh, where was I at? I don't remember I was in Nebraska or, or Dakotas at the time. But anyway, he came through from one job to another and stopped and spent a few days with me. And he had on a pair of uh, black wax calf <laughs> with bright red tops and a white band on the top and, and just a neat looking pair of boots. And I said, where'd you get them boots? He says, well, I ordered them. Uh, and so I, I, at that point in time, I didn't know you could go. I, did, I had no idea you could order a pair of boots made to measure any way you wanted them. I just didn't know that. And uh, so I, I found out where he got them. Uh, I wrote, wrote them, and they sent me an order form, and I, I uh, filled out the order form and did the measurements, didn't quite understand them, sent it back. They sent me a pair of boots. There were some things that didn't fit. The foot fit. Mm-hmm. Tops were way too big. So I called them up, or I wrote a letter. I suppose I wrote a letter because I didn't have a phone. But anyway, um, they got back with me, told me how I was supposed to measure them. But anyway, even though they weren't perfect, they were better than anything I had ever worn in my life. And uh, they fit a stirrup. And I rode an Oxbow stirrup, which probably most people won't know what that is, but it comes down underneath your shank. It's a little narrow, narrow stirrup, kind of round shaped. And uh, and uh, if you got a if if you got a poor pair of boots, you know it pretty quick. If you got a good pair of boots, you know it immediately. So anyway, these these boots were just phenomenal. I, and I and they cost me at that time uh, four hundred and about fifty dollars somewhere right in there. And uh, and I was only making four hundred. I think it was four four twenty five. I believe actually what it was. It doesn't matter. But anyway. Uh, but wasn't that about a month's wages that at that point? Which yeah, you were being paid. Was, I was making four hundred and fifty dollars riding yeah. wages. Yeah. So I got the boots. Got to figure out how to measure them right, and uh, I started saving some money, and I ordered another pair, and they were perfect. I came into camp that evening that the, those boots had came. UPS had delivered them, and I thought, and it was a Friday night, and I thought, man, I'm going to town. So I shower up, and I pull on my new boots, and I had some horses in a pen out there that I had to turn out, and, and I walked out there to turn them horses out, and there was a little piece of barbed wire that was sticking up out of the ground, and I'd been across there 
not a million times, but a lot of times. Didn't know it was there. Never saw it in there. Anyway, I caught that barb, and uh, I had probably had them boots on 15 minutes, and I cut across the toe on them. No. <laughs> Uh, I can see that you guys can see this, but I can see the pain in his face as he's describing this, and I can feel it definitely. Oh, golly. But anyway, so I, I was going somewhere with that story, uh, or that whole, the fit, the fit. What's interesting, uh boot maker that I learned to build boots at, in, or at uh, out there in Utah, and nothing against him at all but he built a different type of boot uh he was more of a shoe man in fact uh randy merrill was his name and he was the uh co-founder of merrill hiking boots which probably many people would know but sure uh he has since sold his interest out on that but uh, and they were they were a nice boot in fact right there above your head is the second pair of boots I ever made and I made them there at Randy's. Cool. And, they, and they look like a cowboy boot. You yeah, know? they do. They look like they've been worn for sure. So anyway, when I went to work for Jay Griffith, um, some point in the time I, I decided I wanted to build a pair of boots and he built them, he builds boots completely different than the way I learned. And uh, so I got a pair of boots built, and I got them finished, and, and in his shop, uh, predominantly where I worked was in the back of the shop, and a few steps up. And I pulled them boots on, and I walked down, and they walked like they were going to walk out from under me. They walked so well. But I learned a lot from him on, on how to do that, and it's the, the basis, the bed under, under your foot, uh, between it, uh, between the insole and the outsole, and the, and it's a positioning of that heel under there. And um, I have people that say that they couldn't couldn't wear a a two inch heel riding heel, and I say I could put you a four inch heel under there, <laughs> and you could walk because they can't they don't think they can't walk in them. But it's a it's a balance and a leveling that's really important. And I and I'm not kidding you. They do. They feel like they just want to walk out from under you. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing feel, you know. So, let's see. I was going with, I kind of get scattered. I'm, I apologize. No, that, that's really good when you're, ta when you're talking about fit. And because when most people go to a store, which is where we kind of started this whole deal, you just kind of pull them on. And if your toes aren't completely crunched and if you don't feel like you've got, you know, something stabbing you in the bottom of your foot, you kind of just make do with it. You know what I mean? Yep. And that brings to another point. Uh, a lot of times uh, as I'm measuring, and, then, and one thing I measure is the length and that gives me a, a a ballpark figure of what last i want to go pull off the shelf uh, for lengthwise the really important measurements from the inside ball to the back of your heel so anyway i'm measuring that and say it's a it measures out a nine and a half and a guy will look and see that and see me write that down he says i don't wear a nine and a half i wear a ten and a half and i says well you wear a nine and a half that's what you need to wear and, that, and and that's happened a lot. And, and I happened to have an old gentleman come in the shop that was a boot and shoe salesman for like 40-some years. And I got to talking about that. And he said, well, you know why that is? I said, no, I don't understand that. He says, you go into a shoe store and you buy a pair of shoes or a boots and they measure you. He says, if they measure you and get you the pair that fits you, they'll be a little tight. But and you probably won't buy them. But he says he measure you a little bigger so that you'll walk out of the store with a purchase. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I don't know if that's true across the board, but I would uh, probably think it is or it was at one time. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that's true when you have people that are trying to find find the right fit if it doesn't feel good in the store, there's very few people that are going to allow that to continue outside the store. Like they, they want to feel good inside the store. They want to look good. Hey, honey, do these look good? Yeah, they look good. And then you kind of move on, <laughs> move on with your day a little bit. Yeah. So one thing that I've, I've heard you talk about before is that, you know, and you mentioned it earlier in this podcast, you've had people that have 
come to you from all over the world to yes, get sir. boots made. Yes, and so uh, this is kind of a two-part question, and you, you may not even remember one part, but how many boots do you think that you many, you have made? How many pairs of boots have, have you made in your life? And if you can divulge this information, who are some of the notable people <laughs> over the years that we would recognize <laughs> that you've made a pair of boots for? Uh, I couldn't tell you how many I've built. I have no idea. Just way too many, huh? Yeah, way too many. Uh, and I've never kept track of it. I could probably, and, and, and I can tell you this, I could go through my books, which we use, I use a ledger book for, for orders. And I could get you the ones that are in there and I could count them up. But there's many, many boots that somebody just calls up that's got boots before and say I want a pair of boots and, and I just mark it down somewhere and I build them so there's a lot of a lot of boots have no record other than scrap paper somewhere which probably is gone but anyway but if you had to guess like I, I want to try to get some <laughs> like is it somewhere between you know 750 and a thousand and is it more like 10,000 like if you if you had to guess and get get as close as you could Well, I've been building boots over 38 years, and so figure if I built, let's make it easy, made 30 pair of boots a, a year, although there was one year that I did twice that many by myself. Right. But, uh, you know, there's, I don't know what that figure would come up to, but. Uh, we'll call it a lot. There's a lot. A, a lot, a lot of boots. <laughs> yeah. and, and so you, you've got, you know, uh, you said about 85% of, uh, you've said before that about 85% of the boots that you've sold have been to working cowboys. But uh, again, to, to that original question, who are some of the notable people? If you can tell us, like, we're not going to put any pressure on you, but if you can tell us, who well, are some of those people that you, you've built You can never for? put pressure on me. Okay, good, good. Fair enough. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you. Oh, come on. Yeah, okay. You can, like, maybe a hint? No. Like, like a hint towards no, somebody? I, I just, uh, that's not a big deal to me, and. And uh, I think I've got them because I don't make a big deal out of it. Okay. So I just, uh, I don't ever divulge that to anybody. Fair enough. Well, maybe one day, maybe mm -hmm. one day when the microphones aren't yeah. on, like I'll catch you at a bad moment and you'll just like kind of let one slip or I might steal one of your ledger books or something like that. We, we can figure it out. Uh, okay. But I, I, I will give you, I'll give you one. Yes. Here, guys, I did this just for you. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Give me one. Uh, a car manufacturer out of Japan. Okay. And that's all I'm that's all you're going to give us all right guys that is for you to guess and for him to know so uh one one quote that i heard from you before and, and i really love this quote but i want to get a little bit more context from it because uh the, the guy that asked you didn't really give you a whole lot of uh, runway to, to talk through it some more but you said that you feel you literally feel like there's a part of you in every boots that every pair of boots that you've made yes sir and i just want you to kind of give our listeners a little bit of a better idea what does that mean because you got guys no matter what their occupation they feel like you know if they're if they're doing a tax return you know hey there's a part of me in this tax return but maybe it doesn't feel that way uh, but for you i mean you're, you're a craftsman like at, at the core level of what you do you're an artisan you're a craftsman you're you're actually building these things but when you say that there's a part of you in every pair of boots that you make what do you mean tell us sir, tell us about that that is uh that's a good question I like that. Uh, it is, as a craftsman, and I think you could relate this to any craftsman that spends hours producing something and using their hands and, and, and through the whole process of it, it's like you, you create, well, you can look, at, look around and see all this leather laying here that's flat leather, you know, and... Uh, Actually, I looked up there because I used to have a lot of leather hanging up there, and I put junk hanging up there now. But <laughs> uh, but it's over there under them benches and, and whatnot. But anyway, you take something that's that is we'll, we'll just use a flat piece of leather, and you create a piece of footwear that is no longer one dimensional but three dimensional and functional. You know, it's, it's just you have created that's as as close as creation i think as we can we can be uh other than maybe being fruitful and producing children uh and that's what i relate it to you know it's just it's you've got you put so much and i and i and any craftsman i i would have to say any craftsman that spends any time 
at that at their craft if, if has that same feeling they put so much of their selves into each uh thing that they create in fact it's interesting to me because there's times that i will i will finish something and even even if it's it's not to my perfection that i i mean not that anything's wrong with it but i've uh I want it to be perfect, and I've never made a perfect boot. In fact, Jay Griffith told me one time, he says, when I make a perfect pair of boots, I'm quitting. But he never did quit. You know, it's just that continually wanting to do better and do better. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to be a perfectionist because you'll never accomplish your goal. But at any rate, uh, so I have a tendency to let them sit here. I don't call them up or I don't ship them out. Uh, they're finished, and I certainly could use the the balance due on them, but it's hard to turn them loose. Sometimes I'll find myself getting to a point where they're getting close to being finished, and I'll go off and start another pair of boots because I'm not quite ready to turn loose of that. That sounds kind of crazy to me as I'm talking about it. I don't I don't think about it when I'm doing it, but now that you've asked the question, I think, man, what's wrong with that guy? <laughs> you well, know, no, you, the, you you put so much effort into something, and you you see the value. You yeah. also, I mean, you want people to pull on the boots right when they get here and walk out the door with them. You don't yeah. want them to walk out in the same shoes that they walked in, and and it's just a different level. Most of these guys that are listening to this, you may not they may not have something in their life that is like that that they put so much effort into they, they kind of lose track of time and the the product on the other end is something that i mean it's something real it's something tangible you know i'll work hard on a podcast and then i just kind of i shoot it out there into the ether and then just hope people listen to it and don't think i'm a complete moron <laughs> but like but at the end of the day you're you're doing something that that can last it can be an heirloom item it's something that somebody can look over on the shelf and point to and say hey i, I got a pair of boots from ray dorwart but i want to go back to the time that you and i actually met and so to kind of bring the listeners up to speed a little bit I was having a ton of trouble finding boots because I've got a long skinny foot. I've got high arches, you know, it just kind of one of those deals that whenever I was just buying shoe, shoes or buying boots off the, off the shelf, they just weren't really fitting quite right. So I went through a couple of different pairs of boots, had to like re sell them to, to friends or whatever the situation was. And so someone told me, Hey, you might, you might look at a custom boot maker that that might be your solution. So I found this article with like the top 50 boot makers, custom boot makers in Texas, right? And they're they're all over the place in Texas, these towns I've never heard of. And I was like, well, why would I go to Texas? Let me see if I can find one in Oklahoma. So I do a quick Google search and, and then yours, your shop was the first one that popped up because I live in Edmond. Just north of Edmond is the town of Guthrie. So I was like, hey, perfect. Let's, let's go figure this out. So I call you up on the phone, you answer, and we kind of start chatting it up a little bit. And I kind of get an idea of your process and all that. And then I ask you, you know, how much do, do boots kind of start? out because I saw in an article that I was going to be like more like 600, 650, something like that. And I don't know how old that article was, but Bo, his apprentice looked at me right now. He's like, what? 650? What are you talking about? And so that's kind of what I had in my head. I was like, oh, that's going to be a little bit of a stretch, but we'll see. And so I call and you say, yeah, the boots start start around about 3,000. And in my head, I think my head like short, like my brain short circuited a little bit. I was like, wait, I either didn't hear that right or, or something's just completely wrong with me. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to waste any more of my time. I certainly don't want to waste more of, of this guy's time I, I need to get off the phone and so i'm trying to you know wrap the phone call up and you just go hey hey kyle how, how'd you hear about us and i was like oh you know I, I saw you on google and all that but what ended up happening is you and i stayed on the phone with one another for about another 10 minutes or so and we started talking about about me why i was looking for boots we started talking about my ministry we started talking a little bit about your upbringing and you even got emotional a couple of times kind of talking whenever i was telling you about my ministry and like i was so inspired by our little 10 minute chat that i just hopped in my truck and drove up to guthrie i was like i gotta meet this guy i gotta meet him and, and just kind of talk to him and i hung out for a couple hours in your shop asking you a bunch of questions you showed me around and it was a cool deal but i think the thing that may have triggered that that reaction from you is i mentioned that this ministry is is mainly for the guys that might find themselves on the fringes the guys that are a little rougher around the edges so i normally talk about you know the mma fighter the former military the police officer but you can certainly put a cowboy or a rodeo person like someone that's that's in in that kind of um, kind of rougher style of things a lot of those guys walk into a church and they don't see themselves in the guys that are walking around there they don't that's see right. themselves in the pastor they're just like and they get this false dichotomy that i talk about all the time that they're like okay i can either be a man 
or I can be a Christian. I certainly can't do both at the same time. There's no such thing as a masculine Christian. I can, and I think that really, really kind of resonated with you. So I wanted to kind of have you talk a little bit more about that because I've thought about that conversation a lot in kind of your reaction to it. But whenever I say something like that, that's like, hey, you know, sometimes guys miss out on who Jesus is because they look at his followers and think, I don't want to really be like that guy. That's that's true. And I, and I, and I told you earlier that, uh, that I knew, I believed there was a God, and I believed that His Son Jesus came to earth in the flesh. But all through that period of time, when I was going to Sunday school and church, it was like uh, Jesus was meek, and meek was like milk toast. You know, what I mean, it was. It just did not fit. You know, I told you, uh, my dad reading all them books to us. You know, that, that those were. Uh, books of men, what I consider men, you know, um, manly, uh, just, uh, I can't, uh, there's just some, when that word comes, uh, well, I'll give you this example, <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't, uh, say this is a good deal, but when I was, uh, I actually started chewing when I was, I don't know, sixth grade. Plug tobacco and leaf tobacco, and, and only because my brother and, and our two friends uh, all one summer uh, drove all over the country putting up hay for people, picking up hay. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them guys chewed and they'd, of course, offered. So anyway, but when I was, uh, 16 I found Copenhagen and at that time Copenhagen came in a I don't know probably still does I, I don't buy it anymore but came in a wax paper can with a lid on it metal lid but it said on there the snuff men like best and I'm pretty sure that isn't on them anymore but that that kind of gives you an idea of men this is this is this is a manly Right, this is what men do. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, but this was the best. It's unflavored, you know, and, and fine cut, and you got to keep track of it in your mouth, and and it's stout and all that, uh, you know, yeah, just whatever. But uh, yeah, that manly thing, and that. So that's why that's why I went the different way when I when I graduated out of high school and left home. I didn't look back, you know, and I, because I, I, that's why I liked it so well up at the Pine Ridge Res, you know, it, it was, that was a wild place, uh, and that was right, started uh, kind of during the AIM movement, which was, if anybody knows what that was, it was American Indian movement, and, and uh, a, just a, a lot of friction and stuff going on there and and uh, but anyway in fact I had camp I was in there I had uh, uh, two BIA cops uh, was shotgun in the back of the head through the pickup window you know I mean just uh, there was another guy that disappeared uh, uh, Tex Horse was his name and, and uh, an Indian and they found him that spring after the melt that he'd been, uh, somebody put a ax in the back of his head and left him lay out there, you know, and it just, I mean, just, not that that's manly, but I'm, I'm, but I mean, that was just that rough and, and uh, not being, I, I don't know, there's more, there's more to it than just fighting and all that. I mean, it's just, uh, Having principles and and living by them and standing by them, and it kind of goes back to uh, that statement John Wayne made in a, in the movie Shoot Us. You know, I won't have a man lay a hand on me, or you know, uh, basically you don't look for trouble, but you don't back up from it. You got a job do you go do a job, whatever it is. Uh,
there's more to it than that. But I, well, but, something you you said earlier, you, you talked about Jesus being meek and mild. That's how he's always described. Oh, Jesus is this kind of cute, cutesy guy. That's you know never too mad, yeah. and he just kind of he kind of he's really easy to deal with. And that's why we talk about the Lion of Judah all the time. Oh, but man, yes. the thing about about meekness that that certainly doesn't mean weakness. You guys have heard that, but one of the better ways of explaining meekness is someone who has the capability of righteous aggression and can use it, but they leave their sword sheathed. Right. Yeah, that's and so, exactly right. That, but, and that's kind of goes to that John Wayne quote to where it's like, no, no, no. It's kind of in Eve talk Chronicles and Narnia, Narnia, there's stuff in there where it's like, you know, they ask, you know, about Aslan, who is, who is God, you know, in lion form or whatever. It's like, you know, is he, is he dangerous? It's like, oh yes, he's very dangerous, but he's good. And so that's the thing that I think about for, for the, the target that most men should, should shoot for yep. is that you should be in an unbelievably dangerous person. And I mean that spiritually, mentally, and physically. Yeah. Like you are someone to reckon with in a conversation or a debate when someone's spewing some sort of crazy ideology, whether it be political or social or something like that, you can get in the fray and fight. But also if someone does lay a hand on you or a, a hand on an innocent person, yes. right? You talk about just war theory and why we're fighting wars overseas that some people don't understand. Well, it's like when certain people can't defend themselves, you need sheepdogs, you need men of God that can enter that fray and protect those individuals. And that's something that I feel like that is that is lost yes. on a lot of the modern generation. And I think that's something that, that you connect with that point of view. Is, is that right? That's exactly right. Absolutely. And you know, uh, when I found out and it was, and, and actually many years after I uh, had accepted Jesus, what the word meek really meant. Uh, I thought, wow, you know, how could such a, uh, a word be misconstrued for so many years? Uh, you know, meek and turn the other cheek and, and all that, you know, but that's not what it really means. That's not the meaning of it. And... And I had really realized long prior to finding out what that word really meant was a fact of, of uh, Jesus, this, this man who ultimately uh, was disfigured beyond recognition as a man and, and had all authority and all power, but did not retaliate. That's not a milk toast man. And think about him. You know, he never cowered from uh, confronting the, the Pharisees. Never. Uh, he could always outsmart them, seemingly. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, it just... He was uh, truly a man's man. And, uh, yeah. So that's why that res and, and knowing all that, and there's so much more in there inside of me, you know, that I just, I can't put words to, but that's what resonated with me when you told me what your ministry did. You know, I, I could relate to it. Well, and that's that's a good thing about this this ministry and about even conversations like this is that guys will pull out things that, that are that are hitting them where they are in their life. And for whatever reason, the reason why we even do this is because that message resonates with so many different people because I see it as unacceptable that a lot of ministries don't cater to those people. They, they got to keep the lights on. They got to they gotta pay everyone's salaries. And so they try to do things that are palatable to the masses. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is they make sure that their stuff is palatable for the women, which is, is not inappropriate, but to a certain degree, you can't expect the men to show up if you're not doing anything to cater to them. And I think it's, it's important for us to have conversations like this it's important for us i know you share your faith often it's important for us to to talk to people in that way because we don't want there to be some singular category of what it means to be a Christian man, right? And there should just be one category because people should all be able to look at Jesus and just model after that. But there's there's a lot of Christian men. They come in different shapes and sizes. They have different backgrounds. Some people sell insurance. Some people make boots. It's just one of those things that you can still be a, a disciple of the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God all at the same time and, and to develop yourself as so, a man. So tell me. He's coming back. So is he coming back as a lamb? 
No, he's no. coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right. And that's the part of the Bible that people are like, eh, that's kind of harder to deal with. And you don't hear a lot of pastors talk about him in, in, the, in the temple kind of turning over the tables and all that, because that's not the blonde hair, blue eyed white guy, Jesus, that we're all like used to, who's, who's super calm and, and super relaxed. And, and that's the thing. That's why we talk about the Lion of Judah so often is not because the Lamb of God's not important. It's because if you only look at God, if you only look at Jesus as the Lamb of God, you're looking at an incomplete picture, yes. right? Because he is certainly both of those things. But I think you, you made the ultimate point, which is when he was on the cross and, and could have got himself out of that situation, he chose not to. Why did he choose not to? Because of us. Yeah. Because there was no other way for us to get to God. There was no other way for us to bridge the gap of sin that is on all of us. The stain of sin is on all of us, even the best of us. And so he he left his sword sheathed and he and he took the pain. And a lot of us guys, I mean, I, I encourage guys to work out all the time. I encourage them to train jujitsu and do hard stuff. And most guys don't do that stuff because gosh darn it, it's just too hard. It's too physically <laughs> hard and mentally I just I just don't know if I can hack it and you know. I would fight in the spiritual realm, but man, I'll just let my pastor do that for me. But no, if, if you're going to be a real man, if, if you're going to be a disciple of the lion of the tribe of Judah, it, it requires a little bit more sacrifice out of you and it requires a different level of input. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. So Ray, I, we've gone everywhere in this conversation, but I feel like if I keep you uh, distracted any longer that there's going to be somebody that has ordered a pair of boots from you that is not going to get them on time. And I definitely don't want to be that way. But before we let you go, is there anything else you want to get off your chest? I just love my Lord Jesus with all my heart. It's interesting. It's interesting to me because uh, I used to not get emotional about stuff at all. Not at all. Uh, I, I mean, to the point where it make me weepy-eyed or, or funny talking, you know. And it's been in the last, probably in the last 15 years it's really come on. And I... And I uh, and and, and it, it's because I think so much of that is the compassion that I've that he's put in my heart from just spending time with him and 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 uh, reading that word and it's so important to read that word. You got to work. Uh, you got to read it every day. You need to read it every day. And. Uh, it says renew your mind daily not once a week or once every christmas or whatever you know every day renew it you know and it's just the what is a relationship he wants a relationship and what is a relationship what is it it's spending time with somebody you have a relationship with your wife i hope you're spending time with your wife you sure. know and, or a friend, a relationship with a friend. Uh, <laughs> a relationship with a dog. <laughs> you know, uh, that's pretty important. I I had a Bible study in, in my shop, in this shop at one time for about a year I, that I had somebody else doing it. And one night, uh, Neil was up there talking about something, and and it, and it had nothing to do with what came to my mind. But the Lord said, "I want a relationship with you now," and it was just like it opened up my eyes because uh, up to that point, I was I had been working for a relationship for once I get to uh, to heaven. But he wants a relationship now, right now. And it just builds, builds day after day. Uh, and eventually, uh, when we stand in his presence, we've already already had a, a, a relationship that's built, you know. That's pretty neat. Absolutely. Well, Ray, I appreciate all the time that you've given us today. I think that's a good place as any to stop. So, Ray Dorwart, thanks for coming on on Daunted Life, a man's podcast. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to to do this. 
I truly appreciate it. Well, there you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed that episode about as much as I enjoyed having that conversation with Ray Dorward. I just got to tell you guys, this is a good episode to share around. So share around with people in your life that maybe grew up doing some of the work uh, that you would see on a farm, or maybe they helped run cattle, or they were real life cowboys. One thing I got to tell you, I'm really excited to share this episode with my grandpa. I got I to gotta figure out a way to get him to listen to it. But this is one of those things that he would be very interested in hearing about Ray and his life and the things he's been able to do. All right, guys, before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know by now, we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. Specifically, we do that by providing content like this podcast that forges spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So for you today, I've got a couple of videos of other interviews that have been done with Ray Dorwart over the years. So there's two YouTube links there so you can check those out. Thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast. I really appreciate it. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher, and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. If we deserve a five-star review, please leave us one, because that is how this podcast is going to continue to grow and get out to the right audience. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the remainder of 2020, so if you want me to come speak on your podcast, at your men's event, to your team, your business, whatever, hit me up, info at undaunted.life. The email is info at undaunted.life. The website is www www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Undaunted Life or Facebook.com backslash Undaunted Life. Check out our free devotionals on the Uversion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song King of Sorrow, which is off their latest record entitled Phantom Anthem. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.